I'm getting confused, so we're going to go ahead and open with a prayer and uh, prepare our hearts to enter in as we worship uh, here today. Now, this one thing we know that regardless of all that's happening right now, regardless of orders and mandates and pandemics and everything else, God's position towards you has not changed. And so what we've got to do, we have got to make sure that our position towards God doesn't change, that nothing changes that position. He's still our Lord, he's still our Savior, he's still our Master, our Baptizer, our Redeemer, and our soon-coming King. And he deserves all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. He deserves that when we come together to praise and worship him. And so let's, let's prepare ourselves with prayer today. We're going to hear the word of God today as well, as well as some awesome testimony. So we need to prepare ourselves. Let's make sure we heard me preach on it any time. And if you stand right after the one, you'll hear me preach on it again. The parable of the sower in Mark chapter 4. Let's prepare our hearts not to be that indifferent ground, that wayside ground. The reason those seeds got stolen is because that ground was hard and it hadn't been broken up and cultivated. So let's, let's ask the Lord as we get started right now. Let's ask the Lord to come in and break open our hearts and cultivate it. 
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to church. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for logging on. I, I trust as you logged on today that you did it with expectation, expecting that you're going to hear from God, expecting that you're going to meet with God, and expecting that you're going to have an awesome worship experience right here online. Malachi chapter 3 tells us that we're to bring all our tithe and offering into the storehouse, that there can be provision in the house of God. I want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for your continued giving into the kingdom, knowing this, that as you do that, you're not only doing it in obedience to God, but the Bible says that our actions reveal something about our heart. So as you give unto the Lord in that manner, you're not just doing it out of obedience, you're revealing that it is your desire to serve God and to worship Him and to obey Him with a cheerful heart. God tells us in that same passage in Malachi that we can prove Him and test Him. And when we're obedient, He will open the windows of heaven and He will pour out blessings on us that we cannot even contain. You can mail your tithe or your offering into the church if you would like. You can text to give and you can give online. So we have a, a host of opportunities for you to be able to show your obedience and your love to God. In today's service, uh, you're going to be introduced to the ministry of Teen Challenge. Now, our church has supported Teen Challenge for many years, and if you've never experienced their ministry, uh, well, you just hold on because you're going to be blessed today. Now, Teen Challenge deals with men and women who have addictions of all sorts, and it inputs God into their life, and God is the one that makes the difference. And today, you'll get to hear a couple of testimonies of men whom God is in the process of changing and doing great things in their life. Not to mention, you'll hear some awesome word by Brother Ed Wilson. So why don't you just go on right where you are and stand with me. Let's enter into worship today. Get up off your couch, out of your recliner, in your living room, kitchen, wherever you're watching. Come on and stand with me and let's worship the Lord. Let's enter into the presence of God and let's prepare our hearts to receive what God has in store for us today. Come on, stand with me. Let's worship Jesus. Welcome to the house of the Lord. Your heart is 
you today for the freedom we have in Jesus Christ. I thank you that you promised that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And I thank you that he is present here with us in this place today. You've never forsaken us. You've never left us. But every step of the way, you've been right here. Through every change that life has brought us through uh, the year of 2020, Father, you've been right there upholding us and strengthening us every step of the way. And we thank you for that. Lord, I just ask today that we would stand in and sit in the freedom that comes from the peace you've given us during this time that we live in right now. God, I ask in the mighty name of Jesus that all of our attention and our affection, that we would turn it to you and find the strength and the peace and the help we need during such chaotic times. Thank you for freedom. Thank you for freedom in Jesus' name. Before you're seated, would you put your hands together one time and give Jesus the praise that he deserves in this house. Come on, he's worthy. The Bible said, ascribe unto the Lord the glory do his name. Hallelujah, let him be exalted. Yeah, thank you, Jesus. Hey, you can be seated this morning. And it's so good in the midst of everything that's changed to know that our Jesus is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. He has not changed. Uh, it is so great to have Teen Challenge with us uh, this morning. Uh, uh, so many years uh, we have witnessed here as a church the change that God has made in the lives of men and women through this program. Never think that God can't use one person to change the world. He did it through this ministry. When he birthed it into the heart of its founder, he, he did it through this ministry and every other. He, he's done it as well, but he did it through this ministry. We've witnessed it. We've seen it. Uh, some of us have family that's even experienced it. And I'm so happy to have them with us today. I'm happy to have a man here today that I like to call my friend. Uh, I don't know what he calls me, but I'm glad to call him my friend. I met him, I, I don't know, about 17 years ago or so I met him. And uh, uh, then he and uh, Ken Drone was, was a nobody at that time. Maybe he's watching today. He's a nobody at that time. <laughs> And uh, uh, but he's now our district superintendent, Brother Ken is. But Brother Wilson, um, it's just been a privilege to to learn from him and to be around him. It's 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 also a privilege to introduce him today and know that I have had an effect on him because he don't have a tie on, and that just means the world to me. Just to know that I had an effect on Ed Wilson, I got <laughs> hey man. So would you welcome Tylus Ed Wilson? <clears throat> Tireless or tireless, I don't know which one it is. Thank you, brother. Well, praise the Lord. Isn't God good? Uh, isn't your pastor something? Uh, that's something to me is indescribable. <laughs> what a joy. What a joy. If he hadn't married up, <clears throat> uh, he would be in very, very serious trouble. I mentioned in the morning first service this morning that uh, Tim's birthday is this week. He'll be old enough to be ordained. And he came to uh, Alabama School of Ministry that I directed for several years. He was just a kid, and he had to wait three years after graduating the uh, ordination level for credentials to be ordained. And so this next April, God willing, uh, he will be ordained into full-time ministry in the Assemblies of God, and we're so thankful uh, for him and for, for his ministry and what he does here in the church. So let me just encourage you to uh, bring or send gifts <laughs> for his birthday. When I went into the office as District Secretary Treasurer, there was an older ministry in a city that I won't name, nor will I name him, but my predecessor had always gone and preached for him the Sunday right around his birthday, and would always take him a birthday gift. And I was told that by my predecessor, so the first time I was invited during that same week 
I carried a birthday gift. I had it beautifully wrapped by my wife. And I handed it to him when I came in the door. He carried it off to his office with a thank you. And he brought it back a little later. And he said, would you give this to me from the pulpit? Because he wanted to remind his congregation that it was his birthday. <laughs> so, <laughs> so would you send gifts to Tim uh, <laughs> on, on, his, on his birthday? Alabama Adult and Teen Challenge is a ministry that started in 1972 in Birmingham, Alabama. It's now grown to four centers across the state of Alabama, reaching individuals with life-controlling problems. It's a one-year Christian residential ministry that touches individuals' lives and causes them to know that Jesus is the answer to all of their past, present, and future problems. And so we're thankful for what God has done in these 48 years to make Teen Challenge what it is today. Uh, sponsors to Alabama Teen Challenge give because they have a burden for people who have life-controlling problems and they want to give into good ground and they want to give to ministry like Teen Challenge. So we're very, very thankful. If you have to give to a specific need to be able to give to a ministry, let me just tell you that we don't have a vehicle, a vehicle that has less than 150,000 miles on it. And some of them are going over 400,000. So we're believing that God is uh, going to give us some new transportation. And then to help you in your, your giving and, uh, and bidding on those items, we just received a Speed the Light van because of the hard work of people like you in this church giving to that ministry. So thank you for your gifts to the work of the Lord. I have a couple of J's with me, Joe and Je Justin, who are going to come and uh, share testimonies with you. And then I'm going to preach to you today from first from First Timothy chapter one, verse number fifteen. First Timothy one fifteen. All right, how y'all doing today, guys? All right. My name is Joseph. I come from Dothan, Alabama, and I'm 20 years old, going on 21. And I grew up in a loving home with a mother, father, and sister. And where things all went wrong for me is probably at about age, teen, age 13 when I first dabbled in drugs. And I put that down for a while because I was in sports, but I finally officially quit sports when I was 16 and got my first car and my first job in the restaurant industry. And if you don't know anything about the restaurant industry, it is very rampant in drugs. And from there, I just started a downward spiral of multiple arrests and drugs and idolatrous relationships and things of that nature, just walking down a full path of sin, all blown out. Until about the age of 19, in February 2019, I was charged with first-degree armed robbery and was facing 20-plus years in prison. So sitting in a cell, just getting my mind together, just ready to be in that lifestyle and be in that environment for about 20 years of my life. Little did I know that God was really working everything out, so I didn't have to do that because he always helps you out when you don't even know it, when you least suspect that he has a plan waiting on you. And so after getting up with my mom and getting up with my lawyer, he finally called me one day right before I had to go to court again. And it was the day before, the night before, on his personal cell phone outside of the office. He said, Joseph, I have something for you. There's hope. And he told me about Alabama Teen Challenge, and he told me about the Baymanet Center. He already called the man at the main center, and he said that they want you to come and do a year program. It's residential. And the thing about it is my charge is a violent crime, so that could be a liability to the people in the center. But they still took me, even technically, though, they could reject me. So God made the impossible happen in that situation. And after of doing a year, I just recently graduated. What God's done in my life, I've decided to stay and do another year as an intern. And I'm deciding to go back to college and pick up where I left off. And the thing about God is just God doesn't give up on you when everybody else does. When nobody else has hope in you, God's got hope in you because he chose you. He called me when I didn't think I'd ever have a relationship with him in my life. Not to mention that I grew up Mormon, which some people consider a cult. But anyways, that's my testimony on what God's done in my life. And just all the praise and glory be to him. My name is Justin Wilson. Oh, I'm actually from Dothan, Alabama, too. 20 years old, fixing to be 21 this week. 
and though most of most of my life I came from a, a little bit of a troubled home but loving it was my mom my grandfather my aunt my cousin and my grandmother oh there was some conflict in between you know, the family members a lot but up around the age of 12 I tracked down my dad looking for a relationship that you know I didn't I didn't necessarily need but come to find out I did need some form of relationship but um I came to realize that I was looking for something that I wasn't supposed to have in a sense I don't believe God wanted me to have it the way that I ended up making it oh it sent me to looking for relationships with people just to have friends and stuff that I didn't need. So I started learning how to fit in with people. And, of course, I found the wrong crowd. I uh, started smoking weed and a little bit later on started moving uh, counterfeit money and getting involved with methamphetamine. That sent me down a long journey of just, just – stupidity really and though I didn't know then but God was working all of it out for a teaching reason and I've got to where I live by the uh the verse in Proverbs Proverbs thirteen twenty. it says you walk with the wise and you will become wise associate with fools and you'll get in trouble that's been that's been my life verse and I continue to think about it every day, and I've moved so much that I really got to the point in life where I used to look in the mirror, and I was like, what am I doing with myself? I'm going nowhere. And I ended up in jail last year uh, with multiple charges, but over 2018, I made, I had many arrests, and everything got resolved into one court date. Uh, last year after being arrested and sitting in the county jail for five months, uh, afterwards got out on probation, done good for a little while, but I thought at that point, you know, okay, I had God, I'm good, I don't need to, I don't need to do anything else. Well, I didn't continue to feed myself spiritually, and I fell back into a relapse, which led me to another arrest and getting here today. I really wasn't supposed to go to Teen Challenge. I don't, well, I mean, God had it set to where I was going to go. But with as many charges and stuff as I was facing, I was I was looking for a lot of time in prison. But just like God did with Joe, he, he brought me to the most caring and loving place that I've ever been. So... I don't exactly know where I'm going yet, but I know that God has a calling for me in some form of ministry, so I'm about five and a half months in, and he's just continued to give me revelation on, you know, what I've really been looking for in life and how to deal with it, so he's going to he's gonna leave me big places. Now I just got to learn to let him do it, and that's my testimony. Amen. Thank you, guys. You can take your seat. When I was pastoring a church, I would have Teen Challenge come in and share, and they'd give their testimonies. And a little old lady, sweet as she could be, but matter of fact, sat over on uh, the far side, and she would always stand to get my attention. Brother Wilson, can I say something? Well, how do you tell her no? So I said, sure. She said, I want to give a testimony that God kept me from that. And she had the greater testimony because God did keep her from that. We have 40 or so employees, give or take a few on any given day. I, I didn't even know that uh, Joseph was my employee. But, uh, but we've got uh, 40 employees and only three are not graduates. And I'm one of the three. 
This fall, God willing, we will have a banquet here at Appleton to raise additional funds for Alabama Adult and, and Teen Challenge, and I'll have with me a guy by the name of Alan Ellis. He'll give his testimony, and I don't want to share a whole lot of it, but Alan is known in Coleman County as Buck Wild. A guy one day said, Alan Ellis has gone Buck Wild. When I met Alan, he was already an employee, and I had just come on as executive director, and he was directing the transition home that we have in McCullough, individuals who have, men who have, who have graduated, and then uh, they get a job and pay back in, and that's self-supporting. We have a ladies' center, the same in uh, Brundage that we opened up uh, last year. So we're very thankful for what God is doing and, and helping us, but um, when Alan found out that that, that I lived in Elmore County, he said, I, w- I lived in three gated communities in Elmore County. And I knew there were no gated communities in Elmore County. So I shared that fact with him, and he said, oh, yes, they're 12 foot high and <laughs> got razor wire over the top. Recently, I asked him in front of our board to give his testimony of how he got in. He was actually in jail, and one of his friends who had been delivered of drugs came in with an application in hand and said, this guard will give you five minutes to fill this out, and I have a place for you. He said, they won't let me in. He said, they will let you in. So he sat down, he filled the application out, And this was a guy that he had run with and he had uh, taken drugs with and committed crimes with. But little did I know, as he told the board that night, I shot at him twice, but had I not lost my balance and had he not ducked, I would have killed him. But yet he walked in with the application. And he said, and now today, Alan is married to the Women's Center director, And they have a little son, Troy Allen, who was born this past January, all because of the grace and the mercy of God. So it leads right into the message from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 15, where Paul said, this is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of which I am chief. Alan was steeped in sin and had problems within his life, but God transformed him by grace and through the power of the Holy Spirit. Today, he is delivered from the bondage of sin that so controlled him in those days of his life. When I began developing this message, I wondered what I might call it, and I really had one title and had actually typed it into uh, the message, but then it came to me, that a better title for the message is, To Any Length. Because God will go to any length, as he did in Alan's life, to save sinners. To any length. He will cause things to happen that will bring people to him, like he did in the testimony of these two gentlemen who are with us today. To any length. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That was the first length that we really look at. That he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe on him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus coming in a virgin birth, having God's stamp of approval upon his life, is dedicated to the Lord. At the age of 12, he's absent from his family as they are leaving and he go, in one city, and he goes, and when they go find him, he is sitting teaching because of the power of God that was resting upon his life. But when he got to be 30, he went down to the Jordan River, and his second cousin baptized him in water, and coming straightway out of the water, the Spirit of God descended upon him like a dove, sat, seated upon him, a voice spoke from heaven, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well 
pleased. And Jesus at that point was driven, Luke said, into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil after fasting for 40 days. The devil came and tempted him in like manner as we are tempted. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. But yet every time the devil misquoted scripture, Jesus quoted it correctly or offered him an alternative scripture and walked away. And at the end of the temptation, angels came and ministered unto him. Then we come to the marriage supper of Cana where he turns the water into wine, which is the first miracle. But God had begun a definite work within his life, causing him to heal the sick, cast out devils, raise the dead, and perform miracles of all description, all because God had an anointing upon his life. But then he began transferring that responsibility over to the 12 that he chose. And when we begin to look at the lives of the 12 as they're depicted in the Word I don't know that any of us would have chosen any one of them, but he chose them, stamped his approval upon them, and sent them out to preach and do the same thing he was doing. So he taught them by the word, he taught them by visuals, and then he gave them the experience of doing what he had done. When they came back, according to Luke Chapter 10, he sent out 70 more, and they went out, and they preached, and they declared, and they came back. Even the demons are subject unto us. Glory not, he said, that demons are subject to you, but glory that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And they began to see the marvelous work of God, but then came the end of the ministry. When it was time for him to be crucified so that all men might have access to his blood, his stripes that would heal us, the crown of thorn that was placed upon him, the power of of evil that had come over him, but the power of God that had sustained him during that time, suspended between heaven and earth, for he had declared, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And so suspended between heaven and earth, he gave up the ghost and he said, it is finished. He wasn't talking about the finish of his life. He was talking about the act of salvation being offered unto every individual. What was needed is finished so that all men who call upon my name shall be saved. And Jesus died that sacrificial death, was put in a borrowed borrowed tomb. On the third day rose from the dead and then ascended unto the Father. On the Mount of Olivet, the disciples asking, will you at this time restore the kingdom? It's not for you to know the day nor the hour the Father has put in his own hand, but you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And at that point, he transferred the responsibility of winning souls to us. For he had said, go and tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power. Now he's saying, when power comes upon you, you shall be witnesses unto me in all the world. So Jesus has now said to us, just like he said to the disciples and to the 70 in chapter 10 of Acts, I am sending you into the world. Go and teach all nations, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have said unto you baptizing him in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost because he wanted us to have a part in the ministry and he'll go to any length to get this gospel message to whomever so that all might be saved. Jesus said that none be lost. So the transfer came to us. Go and preach the gospel to every creature And these signs shall follow them that believe. 
Folks, I am looking for a new sign of the power of God and his evidence in the house of the Lord. You say, well, that is carnal. Nobody should look for a sign. I don't look for a sign. I look for the manifestation of the Spirit of God. For in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, there are listed nine spiritual gifts, and I believe that those gifts need to be operative in the house of God. My mind always thinks of one church that declares itself to be Pentecostal but does not allow spiritual gifts to be operative in the house of God. In small groups, okay, but not in large gatherings. Now, they're really saying that utterance gifts are going to be confusing when Paul said tongues is for the unbeliever. So I don't see what's confusing about that. But what they're saying is we don't want anybody speaking out and anybody interpreting, or we don't want anybody other than those on the platform prophesying, and only the preachers capable of doing that. I'd like to ask a question of that pastor. If I knew him personally, I'd go and talk to him. If he were Assemblies of God, I'd know him, and I'd go talk to him. I'd like to ask him this. If someone was marvelously and divinely healed in your church service, how quickly would you get it in the newspaper? It's a spiritual gift. What we need to do is have a new manifestation of the Spirit of God in the house of God. We need a new insurgents of God's Spirit doing God's will within His house so that people will set up, set up and take notice that God is with us. And when Jesus comes into the house, there are supernatural powers that are unleashed upon the saved and the unsaved alike so that we might declare His glory, we might give praise unto Him, and glorious things will happen. Years ago, Benny Hinn decided he wanted, wanted credentials in the Assemblies of God. He kept them about six months. Dan Besser, former Revival Time speaker and pastor of First Assembly of God in Fort Myers, Florida, was interviewing him. Besser is an executive presbyter of the Assemblies of God. And he said, Brother Hen, would you tell me the greatest miracle you have ever seen? And Hen said, it didn't happen in my ministry. It happened in the ministry of Catherine Kuhlman. He said, I was driving a bus for the Kuhlman ministry. And I picked up a lady whose wrists were turned, her hands were turned on her wrist in the opposite direction, and so were her feet. It seemed that every joint of her body was turned in the wrong direction, and her head was cocked over to one side and frozen. And when I wheeled her into the meeting, I sat her in a specific spot so I could go to the balcony and keep my eye on her because I wanted to watch the healing. But he said, I got caught up in the, in the words of Catherine Kuhlman until I heard this awful cracking and popping. And as I turned to see that lady, her hands were turning on the wrist. Her feet were turning at the ankles, and her head popped up straight and was limber, and she got up and walked because of the power of a glorious God. I want that kind of thing to happen again in the house of God. I want us to dare have faith to believe that God can do anything if we will trust and believe in his name. The miracles of God. But the thing is, he transferred the ability for us to go and teach, us to go and tell, us to go and to promote. Now, when we become witnesses, we first do it by where we go, how we act, how we react, what we say, how we relate. But secondly, we do it by our speech, in what we say. 
for the glory of God. How we say it so that it might be tempered with grace and it might have the Spirit anointing upon it so that people will dare believe in the grace and the goodness of the Lord. And you can tie all these things into one thing. I was a young preacher living in the west end of Birmingham, not far from where the first Teen Challenge Center would later be developed. A lady living next door had given her heart to the Lord, she and her husband. She had a relative who was in the hospital who had a, had a grandson that was there looking after her. And I was asked to go to the hospital. It wasn't but a few blocks. Went out of the hospital and went up to the room. I looked across Grandma's bed and I asked the young man if he was a Christian. He said, I'll get saved if God heals my grandmother. I said, no deals. Come with me. We went across the hall into a prayer room. And he got on his knees and he asked Jesus to come into his heart. We walked back into the room where Grandma was. She was semi-conscious or unconscious. I have no idea. She was not responsive. I prayed. Walked out on going on vacation. Several days later, I returned to Grandma's room only to find Grandma healed by the power of God simply because we believe that God is able. You and I can believe the Lord and what He has promised He will do. So Jesus came and He did all He could do while He was here. Then He transferred the responsibility to us and now it's our responsibility to do all we can while we're here because one of these days Jesus is going to come again. In the clouds of glory He's going to raise those who are dead out of the grave. We who are alive and remain are going to be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. In a twinkling of an eye, we're going to be changed from the physical to the spiritual supernaturally, and we're going to reign with Christ forever and forever and forever. And I believe it's going to happen before the tribulation occurs. The church is not mentioned after Revelation chapter 4, we see the 24 small thrones that are around the throne of God. Seated upon those thrones are the apostles and the 12 patriarchs of the Old Testament. And then there's a throng of people like a sea of glass that's giving glory and praise and honor unto the Lord God. And then we move on to see the seven seals that are opened and the seven trumpets that are blown and the seven vows that are poured out and the three woes that are going to come upon planet earth. And during that time, there's going to be chaos that's going to get worse and worse and worse until the ultimate end. But in this process of time, God never gives up on getting people into the kingdom. In the seventh chapter of the book of Revelation, God puts a seal, his name written upon 144,000 Jews. Now they're called servants in Revelation 14. So we have to believe they were given some kind of responsibility. And whether they were given the responsibility to audibly share the message, they were given the opportunity to live their lives circumspectly before God so that people could see a difference in what was happening in the world and what could happen in them. The 144,000 sealed Jews. I was sitting in my house one Saturday morning when someone rang the doorbell. When I went to the door, there was a precious elderly black lady who identified herself and her granddaughter by name. The next thing out of her mouth was, do you know that only 144,000 are going to heaven? No, I didn't know that, but I 
didn't know that she wasn't one of them. So I told her. Because she's talking about the same 144,000 in chapters 7 and 14 of Revelation. And I said, well, if that's true, you're not one of them. What do you mean? I said, because the Bible says they are male virgin Jews. I said, first off, you're not a man. Secondly, you're not a Jew. And thirdly, if that's your grandchild, you're not a virgin. She snatched that little girl by the arm. I think she missed about three steps as she said, don't you believe a thing that white man said. But it's absolutely true. God will go to any length to save this world from sin and raise us unto life victorious. But then there are two witnesses that are going to come. Two people who have never died. Let's just try Enoch and Elijah on for, for size, okay? And they're going to live and they're going to preach and they're going to declare the glory of God during the tribulation period. And after a while, the demon, the devil himself is going to come out of the pit of hell and he's going to kill these two witnesses and they're going to lie in the streets dead and everybody's going to have a party all around the world, and gifts are going to be given to one another because these two people are dead, and a camera is going to be placed on them. And the world is going to view for three and a half days these men lying on the ground. Scripture. Couldn't have happened 40 years ago. It can happen today. And then they're going to rise again as a testimony of God's power and God's victory, and they're going to ascend unto the Father. The 144,000 who are sealed in chapter 7 are going to rise up, and they are going to ascend into heaven according to Revelation 14. But then for further proof that during the second three and a half years, there's not going to be a church. There's not going to be a body of believers for the first time, God is going to unleash angels to preach the gospel. The Bible says they're going to encompass the earth. I used to think that they were going to really go around the world. But today, they only need a satellite to be viewed in all the world by all different methods and means of technology to preach the everlasting gospel. The first one's going to say, give praise to God, give him glory. The second one's going to say, Babylon, the great city has fallen. And the third one is going to say, don't take the mark of the beast. So we see that 144,000 are still for a purpose. We see two that are going to die in the streets and rise up again and ascend to the Father for a purpose. And then we see three angels who are going to preach the everlasting gospel. He will go to any length to save people from their sins. You see, God so loved the world. This is a faithful saying. Christ came in to the world for the singular purpose of saving souls. First through his ministry, then through his imparting that ministry to us, and then through us leaving planet earth and him continuing that work by whatever method and means to get people to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. But the question is, what are we doing? What are we doing? During a 20-year span of chaotic conditions upon the world, the Assemblies of God grew 297% because we were known a people of faith and of power. I remember a preacher who was going to build a church 
He was a coal miner, so he was down in the mines. He was praying one day in the mines, God, we've run out of material. We have no material to work with to finish the church or to build the church. They had just poured the foundation. And the Lord said, go see Mr. So-and-so and tell him he owes me some money and to pay it with materials. And he went to a builder, a building supply company, and he said to the owner, God sent me to tell you that you owe him money. And he wants it in material. And here's the list. The man grabbed the list and said, I don't owe God anything. And his brother Attaway Orton started to walk out the builder, building. The owner yelled after him, where do you want it delivered? And the next day, he shouted all over the top of the building material because he had the, the material to build the entire building absolutely free because God, because God wanted people saved. You and I need to come to a place where we again exhibit the kind of faith that will say, God is in it, God can do it, God will do it, and I'm going to dare believe that God can do it again, just like he did in the past. But what are we doing? How much are we believing? How much are we trusting In 1914, the Assemblies of God was formed. In 1918, the Spanish flu hit. And churches were closed just like now. But when the doors reopened, there was astronomical growth in the Pentecostal movement because people knew that there it was preached, God can do it. But there is one difference in 1918 and today. In the four years from the inception of the Assemblies of God until 1818 when the flu epidemic hit, there were people in the church who were either filled with the Holy Ghost or ardently seeking, like our bylaws say, the Holy Spirit baptism. And probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 90 to 100% of Assemblies of God people spoke in tongues. But today, by count, less than 25%. What are they going to find? when they come back to our churches? What will your children and grandchildren find? What will your nieces and nephews find? What will your friends, what will your other relatives, or what will your business associates find if they came into Appleton Assembly of God? And how much will you have contributed to creating that atmosphere of spiritual power? Because God wants to do it again, going to any length to save your loved ones from their sins. Father, in Jesus' name, our hearts, our hearts are welcoming to you at this point. We want you to do what you want. We've been selfish long enough. We've wanted it our way long enough. We've wanted instantaneous everything long enough. So, Lord, help us tarry until we be endued with power. Help us come into a new Holy Ghost experience and let it be beyond tongues. But let tongues be the beginning. And then move into the fruit of the Spirit that our lives will exhibit 
the love, for by this all men will know we're disciples if we have love one for the other. And Lord, let us move into the gifts of the Spirit. Let us be like the little lady that went to the drugstore and saw an older lady with her face in her hand sitting before the druggist window. Let us be like her when you said, go and pray for her. And she went. And she prayed. Names and telephone numbers were exchanged. Let us be like that little younger lady that the next day was cleaning her house when the telephone rang. And an old man said, did you pray for my wife yesterday at the drugstore? Could you come over to the house? And upon arrival, the little young lady found the man who escorted her into the kitchen, picked up a vial of medication, and said she didn't even take a dose. And the young lady, wanting to have faith, thought she must have died. Only to have the old gentleman say, would you, would you follow me to the bedroom? And upon the opening of the door, there sat the old lady, fully clothed and divinely healed by the power of God. And Lord, let us hear the old man say, now will you tell us about this Jesus who healed my wife? God, I pray that you unleash all of these who are sitting before me and all of those who are watching on the Internet. Unleash us, O oh God, into a world that you have done everything and will do everything you can do to change for the good. But you have commissioned us in the Great Commission to win the lost, to heal the sick, to cast out devils, to perform the miracles of God. Let us be about your business. Would you stand? And as, as I close my portion of the message, could I ask you to commit yourself right where you are, afresh and anew, to the commission God has placed upon your life? There's not a person in the room who's saved that's not a minister. And if you're not a minister, you're not saved. You can say, but preacher, I don't preach. I didn't ask you to preach. I asked you to minister. You're going to meet people I'll never meet. And I'm going to meet people you'll never meet. So I need you to reach people that I'm not going to reach, and I'm going to reach people you're not going to reach. So let's work together. Let's get it done. Let's build the kingdom. Let none be lost. For Jesus not only ascended into heaven from the Mount of Olivet, but he has taken to the position of, of an intercessor sitting at the right hand of God praying for you, calling you by name and saying, I'll bless them if they'll go. And he's saying to you, sick them. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Would you write where you are? Just bow your head and ask God to recommission you or to commission you. And if you should be lost, ask him to save you. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, if you believe in your heart, God hath raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So the preacher came today. He came in the personage of the Holy Spirit, he only used me. <laughs> I'm so thankful. But he came today, 
And he came to commission you. So we're going to leave this room to do the work, to establish the kingdom. So would you just say, Lord, take me and use me. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Lord, use us. Establish us in the kingdom. Establish us in the work. Use us that we might be all that we can be for the kingdom's sake. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Justin, in his message, in his testimony a little while ago, talked about letting Jesus live in him. It dawned on me some time back, and I, I've used it and shocked congregations all over the place <laughs> by making this bold statement. I don't live a Christian life. I quit trying. When I started letting God or Jesus live his life through me. So all I ask, God, are you pleased with me today? I sat on the presbytery beside a man just lost his wife recently and his son nearly died with COVID within weeks of each other. The alarm on his watch went off at 10 o'clock. I leaned over and said, what was that? He said, it goes off every day at 10 o'clock. And I stop what I'm doing and I ask myself, am I closer to Jesus today than I was at this time yesterday? He wrote a book, and the three things he taught was that we come into a relationship with Jesus as Savior, then servant, and ultimately friend. So I ask, which of those three are you? Have you gotten to that place where you can say, Jesus is my friend, and I'm his. God bless you. Thank you, Brother Wilson. I'm so thankful for our God who will go out of his way. Think of, think of everything that he does to see that people are saved. He used Jesus. He used the church. Even the rapture of the church itself is a sign to the world that it's real. Then during that time, he uses those that were sealed. He uses these two old patriarchs. He uses angels. God exhausting every resource to see that a soul is saved. That's a loving God. you understand? I, we, we're going to receive an offering, but I want to sing a song, which I believe is in celebration of everything that he said. It's an old song. But I, I love, I love I love the words of this song because it's everything that he just said, and he said one time that's his favorite song. And I, I want us to I want us to sing this. You'll know it. it says, when peace like a river
Today would be okay with me. Today would be okay. Praise God. We've got a couple of ushers that are going to come around and serve you. These two aren't as pretty as the ones from the first service. I apologize for this so much. They got the good looking ones. You get the kindness. I apologize uh, from the bottom of my heart. As you give today, uh, give as unto the Lord, keeping in mind that whatsoever a man sows, that will he reap. Now you're sowing into a ministry of deliverance. And just understand that, that the very harvest you reap as you're sowing into somebody else's deliverance could be your own family. Could be your, your own family. A, a, a long time ago, uh, I, I was, I was, God, I was, this was before I was ever pastoring. I, I was, I was, I was contemplating this subject of, of sowing and giving at, at, at the time. And, and God said to me, you want to see your family saved? Yes, I do. I didn't even have a family at the time. But do you want them to be saved? Yes, I do. Then sow into the lives of others. And what you sow, you'll reap the harvest of it. I have reaped that harvest in my personal family. I still got other. I still got other family out there that the sickle ain't put to them yet. But it's going to be. They just don't know it yet. And I have reaped that harvest. I've not had to beg my wife to come. I've not had to beg my kids to come. As a matter of fact, there are times when I don't want to come and they say, you know better than that. <laughs> and I'm thankful for that. God's good as his word. As you give unto the Lord today, you give with this in mind that you're sowing into the kingdom. And God will honor his word. He will not be mocked. You won't have it. I promise you that. Father, thank you for this chance to give. As your people give into the kingdom, Lord, would you take it like Jesus did that little boy's lunch and break it, tear it all up. And cause it to meet the need of multitudes, Lord, I pray. I pray the offering that is given, it meets needs that where the numbers can't even match up and add up because we know it was something done divine.